The Culture Industry, Enlightenment as Mass Deception, by Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer. According to Marxist.org, this is most of one chapter from Dialectic of Enlightenment. The sociological theory that the loss of the support of objectively established religion, the dissolution of the last remnants of pre-capitalism, together with technological and social differentiation or specialization, have led to cultural chaos is disproved every day, for culture now impresses the same stamp on everything. Films, radio, and magazines make up a system which is uniform as a whole and in every part. Even the aesthetic activities of political opposites are are one in their enthusiastic obedience to the rhythm of the iron system. The decorative industrial management buildings and exhibition centers in authoritarian countries are much the same as anywhere else. The huge gleaming towers that shoot up everywhere are outward signs of the ingenious planning of international concerns, toward which the unleashed entrepreneurial system, whose monuments are a mass of gloomy houses and business premises in grimy, spiritless cities, was already hastening. Even now, the older houses just outside the concrete city centers look like slums, and the new bungalows on the outskirts are at one with the flimsy structures of world fairs in their praise of technical progress and their built-in demand to be discarded after a short while like empty food cans. Yet the city housing projects designed to perpetuate The individual as a supposedly independent unit in a small hygienic dwelling make him all the more subservient to his adversary, the absolute power of capitalism. Because the inhabitants as producers and as consumers are drawn into the center in search of work and pleasure, all the living units crystallize into well-organized complexes. The striking unity of microcosm and macrocosm presents men with a model of their culture the false identity of the general and the particular. Under monopoly, all mass culture is identical, and the lines of its artificial framework begin to show through. The people at the top are no longer so interested in concealing monopoly. As its violence becomes more open, so its power grows. Movies and radio need no longer pretend to be art. The truth that they are just business is made into an ideology in order to justify the rubbish they deliberately produce. They call themselves industries, and when their directors' incomes are published, any doubt about the social utility of the finished products is removed. Interested parties explain the culture industry in technological terms. It is alleged that because millions participate in it, certain reproduction processes are necessary that inevitably require identical needs in innumerable places to be satisfied with identical goods. The technical contrast between the few production centers and the large number of widely dispersed consumption points is said to demand organization and planning by management. Furthermore, it is claimed that standards were based in the first place on consumers' needs, and for that reason were accepted with so little resistance. The result is the circle of manipulation and retroactive need in which the unity of the system grows ever stronger. No mention is made of the fact that the basis on which technology acquires power over society is the power of those whose economic hold over society is greatest. A technological rationale is the rationale of domination itself. It is the coercive nature of society alienated from itself. Automobiles, bombs, and movies keep the whole thing together until until their leveling element shows its strength in the very wrong which it furthered. It has made the technology of the culture industry no more than the achievement of standardization and mass production, sacrificing whatever involved a distinction between the logic of the work and that of the social system. This is the result not of a law of movement in technology as such, but of its function in today's economy. The need which might resist central control has already been suppressed by the control of the individual consciousness. The step from the telephone to the radio has clearly distinguished the roles. The former still allowed the subscriber to play the role of subject and was liberal. The latter is democratic 
It turns all participants into listeners and authoritative authoritatively subjects them to broadcast programs which are all exactly the same. No machinery of rejoinder has been devised, and private broadcasters are denied any freedom. They are confined to the apocryphal field of the amateur and also have to accept organization from above. But any trace of spontaneity from the public in official broadcasting is controlled and absorbed by talent scouts. Studio competitions and official programs of every kind selected by professionals. Talented performers belong to the industry long before it displays them. Otherwise, they would not be so eager to fit in. The attitude of the public, which ostensibly and actually favors the system of the culture industry, is a part of the system and not an excuse for it. If one branch of art follows the same formula as one with a very different medium and content, if the dramatic intrigue of broadcast soap operas becomes no more than useful material for showing how to master technical problems at both ends of the scale of musical experience, real jazz or a cheap imitation, or if a movement from a Beethoven symphony is crudely adapted for a film soundtrack in the same way as a Tolstoy novel is garbled in a film script, then the claim that this is done to satisfy the spontaneous wishes of the public is no more than hot air. We are closer to the facts if we explain these phenomena as inherent in the technical and personnel apparatus, which down to its last cog itself forms part of the economic mechanism of selection. In addition, there is the agreement, or at least the determination, of all executive authorities not to produce or sanction anything that in any way differs from their own rules, their own ideas about consumers, or above all themselves. In our age, the objective social tendency is incarnate in the hidden subjective purposes of company directors, the foremost among whom are in the most powerful sectors of industry, steel, petroleum, electricity, and chemicals. Culture monopolies are weak and dependent in comparison. They cannot afford to neglect their appeasement of the real holders of power if their sphere of activity in mass society, a sphere producing a special or a specific type of commodity, which anyhow is still too closely bound up with easygoing liberalism and Jewish intellectuals, is not to undergo a series of purges. The dependence of the most powerful broadcasting company on the electrical industry or of the motion picture industry on the banks is characteristic of the whole sphere, whose individual branches are themselves economically interwoven. All are in such close contact that the extreme concentration of mental forces allows demarcation lines between different firms and technical branches to be ignored. The ruthless unity in the culture industry is evidence of what will happen in politics. Marked differentiations, such as those of A and B films or of stories and magazines in different price ranges, depend not so much on subject matter as on classifying, organizing, and labeling consumers. Something is provided for all so that none may escape. The distinctions are emphasized and extended. The public is catered for with a hierarchical range of mass-produced products of varying quality, thus advancing the rule of complete quantification. Everybody must behave as if spontaneously in accordance with his previously determined and indexed level and choose the category of mass product turned out for his type. Consumers appear as statistics on research organization charts and are divided by income groups into red, green, and blue areas. The technique is that used for any type of propaganda. How formalized the procedure is can be seen when the mechanical differentiated products prove to be all alike in the end. That the difference between the Chrysler range and General Motors products is basically illusory strikes every child with a keen interest in varieties. What connoisseurs discuss as good or bad points serve only to perpetuate the semblance of competition and range of choice. The same applies to the Warner Brothers and Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer uh, productions. 
But even the differences between the more expensive and cheaper models put out with the same firm steadily diminish. For automobiles, there are such differences as the number of cylinders, cubic capacity, details of patented gadgets. And for, the, and for films, there are the number of stars, the extravagant use of technology, labor and equipment, and the introduction of the latest psychological formulas. The universal criterion of merit is the amount of conspicuous production, of blatant cash investment. The varying budgets in the culture industry do not bear the slightest relation to factual values, to the meaning of the products themselves. Even the technical media are relentlessly forced into uniformity. Television aims at a synthesis of radio and film and is held up only because the interested parties have not yet reached agreement, but its consequences will be quite enormous and promise to intensify the impoverishment of aesthetic matter so drastically that by tomorrow the thinly veiled identity of all industrial culture products can come triumphantly out into the open, derisively fulfilling the Wagnerian dream of the Gesam, Gesam, it's work. The fusion of all the arts in one work. The alliance of word, image, and music is all the more perfect than in Tristan, because these sensuous elements, which all approvingly reflect the surface of social reality, are in principle embodied in the same technical process, the unity of which becomes its distinctive content. This process integrates all the elements of the production, from the novel, shaped with an eye to the film, to the last sound effect. It is the triumph of invested capital, whose title as absolute master is etched deep into the hearts of the dispossessed, and the employment line. It is the meaningful content of every film, whatever plot the production team may have selected. The man with leisure leisure has to accept what the culture manufacturers offer him. Kant's formalism still expected a contribution from the individual, who was thought to relate the varied experiences of the senses to fundamental concepts. But industry robs the individual of his function. Its prime service to the customer is to do his schematizing for him. Kant said that there was a secret mechanism in the soul which prepared direct intuitions in such a way that they could be fitted into the system of pure reason. But today, that secret has been deciphered. While the mechanism is to all appearances planned by those who serve up the data of experience, that is, by the culture industry, it is in fact forced upon the latter by the power of society, which remains irrational. However, we may try to rationalize it. And this inescapable force is processed by commercial agencies so that they give an artificial impression of being in command. There is nothing left for the consumer to classify. Producers have done it for him. Art for the masses has destroyed the dream, but still conforms to the tenets of that dreaming idealism, which critical idealism balked at. Everything derives from consciousness. For Mella Branch and Berkeley, from the consciousness of God, and mass art from the consciousness of the production team. Not only are the hit songs, stars, and soap operas cyclically recurrent and rigidly invariable types, but the specific content of the entertainment itself is derived from them and only appears to change. The details are interchangeable. The short interval sequence, which was effective in a hit song, the hero's momentary fall from grace, which he accepts as good sport, the rough treatment which the beloved gets from the male star, the latter's rugged defiance of the spoilt Harris, are, like all the other details, ready-made cliches to be slotted in anywhere. They never do anything more than fulfill the purpose allotted them in their overall plan. Their whole raison d'etre is to confirm it by being its constituent parts. As soon as the film begins, it is quite clear how it will end, and who will be rewarded, punished, or forgotten. In light music, once the trained ear has heard the first notes of the hit song, it can guess what is coming and feel flattered when it does come. The average length of the short story has to be rigidly adhered to. Even gags, effects, and jokes are calculated like the setting in which they are placed. 
They are the responsibility of special experts and their narrow range makes it easy for them to be apportioned in the office. The development of the culture industry has led to the predominance of the effect, the obvious touch, and the technical detail over the work itself, which once expressed an idea but was liquidated together with the idea. When the detail won its freedom, it became rebellious and, in the period from Romanticism to Expressionism, asserted itself as free expression, as a vehicle of protest against the organization. In music, the single harmonic effect obliterated the awareness of form as a whole. In painting, the individual color was stressed at the expense of pictorial composition, and in the novel, psychology became more important than structure. The totality of the culture industry has put an end to this. Though concerned ex exclusively with effects, it crushes their insubordination and makes them sub subserve the formula, which replaces the work. The same fate is inflicted on whole and parts alike. The whole inevitably bears no relation to the details. Just like the career of a successful man into which everything is made to fit as an illustration or a proof, whereas it is nothing more than the sum of all those idiotic events. The so-called dominant idea is like a file which ensures order, but not coherence. The whole and the parts are alike. There is no antithesis on, and no connection. Their prearranged harmony is a mockery of what had to be striven after in the great bourgeois works of art. In Germany, the graveyard stillness of the, of the dictatorship already hung over the gayest films of the democratic era. The whole world is made to pass through the filter of the culture industry. The old experience of the moviegoer who sees the world outside as an extension of the film he has just left because the latter is intent upon reproducing the world of everyday perceptions is now the producer's guideline. The more intensely and flawlessly his techniques duplicate empirical objects, the easier it is today for the illusion to prevail that the outside world is the straightforward continuation of that presented on the screen. This purpose has been furthered by mechanical reproduction since the lightning takeover by the sound film. Real life is becoming indistinguishable from the movies. The sound film, far surpassing the theater of illusion, leaves no room for imagination or reflection on the part of the audience, who is unable to respond within the structure of the film, yet deviate from its precise detail without losing the thread of the story. Hence, the film forces its victims to equate it directly with reality. The stunting of the mass media consumer's powers of imagination and spontaneity does not have to be traced back to any psychological mechanisms. He must describe the loss, of the loss of those attributes to the objective nature of the products themselves, especially to the most characteristic of them, the sound film. They are so designed that quickness, powers of observation, and experience are undeniably needed to apprehend them at all. Yet sustained thought is out of the question if the spectator is not to miss the relentless rush of facts. Even though the effort required for his response is semi-automatic, no scope is left for the imagination. Those who are so absorbed by the world of the movie, by its images, gestures, and words, that they are unable to supply what really makes it a world, do not have to dwell on particular points of its mechanics during a screening. All the other films and products of the entertainment industry, which they have seen, have taught them what to expect. They react automatically. The might of industrial society is lodged in men's minds. The entertainment's manufacturers know that their products will be consumed with alertness, even when the customer is distraught, for each of them is a model of the huge economic machinery which has always sustained the masses, whether at work or at leisure, which is akin to work. From every sound film and every broadca broadcast program, the social effect can be inferred, which is exclusive to none, but is shared by all alike. The culture industry as a whole has molded men as a type unfailingly reproduced in every product. All the agents of this process, from the producer to the women's clubs, 
take good care that the simple reproduction of this mental state is not nuanced or extended in any way. The art historians and guardians of culture who complain of the extinction in the West of a basic style-determining power are wrong. The stereotyped appropriation of everything, even the incohate or in, in, inco, <laughs> incohate, for the purposes of mechanical reproduction surpasses the rigor and general currency of any real style in the sense in which cultural cognis- cognoscenti celebrate the organic pre-capitalist past. No palestrina could be more of a purist in element eliminating every unprepared and unresolved discord than the jazz arranger in suppressing any development which does not conform to the jargon. When jazzing up Mozart, he changes him not only when he is too serious or too difficult, but when he harmonizes the melody in a different way, perhaps more simply, than is customary now. No medieval builder can have scrutinized the subjects for church windows and sculptures more suspiciously than the studio hierarchy scrutinizes a work by Balzac or Hugo before finally approving it. No medieval theologian could have determined the degree of the torment to be suffered by the damned in accordance with the order of divine love more meticulously than the producers of shoddy epics calculated the torture to be undergone by the hero or the exact point to which the leading lady's hemline shall be raised. The explicit and implicit exoteric and esoteric catalogue of the forbidden and tolerated is so extensive that it not only defines the area of freedom, but is all powerful inside it. Everything down to the last detail is shaped accordingly. Like its counterpart, avant-garde art, the entertainment industry determines its own language, down to its very syntax and vocabulary, by the use of anathema. The constant pressure to produce new effects, which must conform to the old pattern, serves merely as another rule to increase the power of the conventions when any single effect threatens to slip through the net. Every detail is so firmly stamped with sameness that nothing can appear which is not marked at birth, or does not meet with approval at first sight. And the star performers, whether they produce or reproduce, use this jargon as freely and fluently and with as much gusto as if it were the very language which it silenced long ago. Such is the ideal of what is natural in this field of activity, and its influence becomes all the more powerful. The more technique is perfected and diminishes the tension between the finished product and everyday life. The paradox of this routine, which is essentially travesty, can be detected and is often predominant in everything that the culture industry turns out. A jazz musician who is playing a piece of serious music, one of Beethoven's simplest minuets, syncopates it involuntarily and will smile superciliously when asked to follow the normal divisions of the beat. This is the nature which, complicated by the ever-present and extravagant demands of the specific medium, constitutes the new style and is a system of non-culture to which one might even concede a certain unity of style if it really made any sense to speak of stylized barbarity. The universal imposition of this stylized mode can even go beyond what is quasi-officially sanctioned or forbidden. Today, a hit song is more readily forgiven for not observing the 32 beats or the compass of the ninth than for containing even the most clandestine melodic or harmonic detail which does not conform to the idiom. Whenever Orson Welles offends against the tricks of the trade, he is forgiven because his departures from the norm are regarded as calculated mutations, which serve all the more strongly to confirm the validity of the system. The constraint of the technically conditioned idiom which stars and directors have to produce as nature so that the people can appropriate it extends to such fine nuances that they almost attain the subtlety of the devices of an avant-garde work as against those of truth. The rare capacity minutely to fulfill the obligations of the natural idiom in all branches of the culture industry becomes the criterion of efficiency. What and how they say it must be measurable by everyday language, as in logical positivism. 
The producers are experts. The idiom demands an astounding productive power, which it absorbs and squanders. In a diabolical way, it has overreached the culturally conservative distinction between genuine and artificial style. A style might be called artificial, which is imposed from without on the refractory refractory impulses of a form. But in the culture industry, every element of the subject matter has its origin in the same apparatus as that jargon whose stamp it bears. The quarrels in which the artistic experts become involved with sponsor and censor about a lie going beyond the bounds of credibility are evidence not so much of an inner aesthetic tension as of a divergence of interests. The reputation of the specialist in which a last remnant of objective independence sometimes finds refuge conflicts with the business politics of the church or the concern which is manufacturing the cultural commodity. But the thing itself has been essentially objectified and made viable before the established authorities begin to argue about it. Even before Zanuck acquired her, St. Bernadette was regarded by her latter-day hagi- hagiographer as brilliant propaganda for all interested parties. That is what became of the emotions of the character. Hence, the style of the culture industry, which no longer has to test itself against any refractory material, is also the negation of style. The reconciliation of the general and particular, of the rule and the specific demands of the subject matter, the achievement of which alone gives essential, meaningful content to style, is futile because there has ceased to be the slightest tension between opposite poles. These concordant extremes are dismally identical. The general can replace the particular and vice versa. Nevertheless, this caricature of style does not amount to something beyond the genuine style of the past. In the culture industry, the notion of genuine style is seen to be the aesthetic equivalent of domination. Style considered as mere aesthetic regulatory is a romantic dream of the past. The unity of style not only of the Christian Middle Ages but of the Renaissance expresses in each case the different structure of social power and not the obscure experience of the oppressed in which the general was enclosed. The great artists were never those who embodied a wholly flawless and perfect style, but those who used style as a way of hardening themselves against the chaotic expression of suffering, as a negative truth. The style of their works gave what was expressed that force without which life flows away unheard. Those very art forms which are known as classical, such as Mozart's music, contain objective trends which represent something different to the style which they incarnate. As late as Schoenberg and Picasso, the great artists have retained a mistrust of style and at crucial points have subordinated it to the logic of the, of the matter. What Dadaists and Expressionists call the untruth of style as such triumphs today in the sung jargon of a crooner and the carefully contrived elegance of a film star, and even in the admirable expertise of a photograph of a peasant's squalid hut. Style represents a promise in every work of art. That which is expressed is subsumed through style into the dominant forms of generality, into the language of music, painting, or words, in the hope that it will be reconciled thus with the idea of true generality. This promise held out by the work of art that it will create truth by lending new shape to the conventional social forms is as necessary as it is hypocritical. It unconditionally posits the real forms of life as it is by suggesting that fulfillment lies in their aesthetic derivatives. To this extent, the claim of art is always ideology too. However, only in this confrontation with tradition of which style is the record can art express suffering. That factor in a work of art which enables it to transcend reality certainly cannot be detached from style, but it does not consist of the harmony actually realized, of any doubtful unity of form and content, within and without, of individual and society. It is to be found in those features in which discrepancy appears, in the necessary failure of the passionate striving for identity. Instead of exposing itself to this failure in which the style of the great work of art has always achieved self-negation, 
the inferior work has always relied on its similarity with others, on a surrogate identity. In the culture industry, this imitation finally becomes absolute. Having ceased to be anything but style, it reveals the latter's secret, obedience to the social hierarchy. Today, aesthetic barbarity completes what has threatened the creations of the spirit since they were gathered together as culture and neutralized. To speak of culture was always contrary to culture. Culture as a common denominator already contains an embryo that schematization and process of cataloging and classification, which bring culture within the sphere of administration. And it is precisely the industrialized, the consequent subsumption, which entirely accords with the notion of culture. By subordinating in the same way and to the same end all areas of intellectual creation, by occupying men's senses from the time they leave the factory in the evening to the time they clock in again the next morning with matter that bears the impress of the labor process they themselves have to sustain throughout the day, this subsumption mockingly satisfies the concept of a unified culture, which the philosophers of personality contrasted with mass culture. And so the culture industry, the most rigid of all styles, proves to be the goal of liberalism, which is reproached for its lack of style. Not only do its categories and contents derive from liberalism, domesticated naturalism as well as operata and rev review, but the modern culture monopolies form the economic area in which, together with the corresponding entrepreneurial types, for the time being, some part of its sphere of operation survives, despite the process of disintegration elsewhere. It is still possible to make one's way in entertainment if one is not too obstinate about one's own concerns and proves appropriately pliable. Anyone who resists can only survive by fitting in. Once his particular brand of deviation from the norm has been noted by the industry, he belongs to it as does the land reformer to capitalism. Realistic dissidence is the trademark of anyone who has a new idea in business. In the public voice of modern society, accusations are seldom audible. If they are, the perceptive can already detect signs that the dissident will soon be reconciled. The more immeasurable the gap between chorus and leaders, the more certainly there is room at the top for everybody who demonstrates his superiority by well-planned originality. Hence, in the culture industry, too, the liberal tendency to give full scope to its able men survives. To do this for the efficient today is still the function of the market, which is otherwise proficiently controlled. As for the market's freedom and the high period of art as elsewhere, it was freedom for the stupid to starve. Significantly, the system of the culture industry comes from the more liberal industrial nations and all its characteristic media, such as movies, radio, jazz, and magazines, flourish there. Its progress, to be sure, had its origin in the general laws of capital. Gaumont and Path, Olstein and Hugenberg followed the international trend with some success. Europe's economic dependence on the United States after war and inflation was a contributed, con, contributory factor. The belief that the barbarity of the culture industry is a result of cultural lag, of the fact that the American consciousness did not keep up with the growth of technology, is quite wrong. It was pre-fascist Europe which did not keep up with the trend toward the culture monopoly. But it was this very lag which left in intellect and creativity some degree of independence and enabled its last representatives to exist, however dismally. In Germany, the failure of democratic control to permeate life had led to a paradoxical situation. Many things were exempt from the market mechanism which had invaded the Western countries. The German educational system, universities, theaters with artistic standards, Great orchestras and museums enjoyed protection. The political powers, state and municipalities, which had inherited such institutions from absolutism, had left them with a measure of the freedom from the forces of power which dominates the market, such as princes and feudal lords had done up to the 19th century. 
This strengthened art in this late phase against the verdict of supply and demand, and increased its resistance far beyond the actual degree of protection. In the market itself, the tribute of a quality for which no use has been found was turned into purchasing power. In this way, respectable literary and music publishers could help authors who yielded little more in the way of profit than the respect of the connoisseur. Or connoisseur. Okay, I hate that word. But what completely fettered the artist was the pressure and the accompanying drastic threats, always to fit into business life as an aesthetic expert. Formerly like Kant and Hume, they signed their letters, Your Most Humble and Obedient Servant, and undermined the foundations of throne and altar. Today, they address heads of government by their first names. Yet in every artistic activity, they are subject to their illiterate masters. The analysis Tuckville offered a century ago has in the meantime proved wholly accurate. Under the private culture monopoly, it is a fact that tyranny leaves the body free and directs its attack at the soul. The ruler no longer says, you must think as I do or die. He says, you are free not to think as I do. Your life, your property, everything shall remain yours. But from this day on, you are a stranger among us. Not to conform means to be rendered powerless, economically and therefore spiritually, to be self-employed. When the outsider is excluded from the concern, he can only too easily be accused of incompetence. Whereas today in material production, the mechanism of supply and demand is disintegrating, in the superstructure, it still operates as a check in the ruler's favor. The consumers are the workers and employees, the farmers and lower middle class. Capitalist production so confines them, body and soul, that they fall helpless victims to what is offered them. As naturally as the ruled always took the morality imposed upon them more seriously than did the rulers themselves, the deceived masses are today captivated by the myth of success, even more than the successful are. Immovably, they insist on the very ideology which enslaves them. The misplaced love of the common people for the wrong which has done them is a greater force than the cunning of the authorities. It is stronger even than the rigorism of the Hayes office. Just as in certain great times in history, it has inflamed greater forces that were turned against it, namely the terror of the tribunals. It calls for Mickey Rooney in preference to the tragic Garbo, for Donald Duck instead of Betty Boop. The industry submits to the vote which it has itself inspired. What is a loss for the firm which cannot fully exploit a contract with a declining star is a legitimate expense for the system as a whole. By craftily sanctioning the demand for rubbish, it inaugurates total harmony. The connoisseur and the expert are despised for their pretentious claim to know better than the others even though culture is democratic and it distributes its privileges to all. In view of the ideological truce, the conformism of the buyers and the effrontery of the producers who supply them prevail. The result is a constant reproduction of the same thing. A constant sameness governs the relationship to the past as well. What is new about the phase of mass culture compared with the late liberal stage is the exclusion of the new. The machine rotates on the same spot. While determining consumption, it excludes the untried at a, as a risk. The movie makers distrust any manuscript which is not reassuringly backed by a bestseller. Yet for this very reason, there is never-ending talk of ideas, novelty, and surprise of what is taken for granted but has never existed. Tempo and dynamics serve this trend. Nothing remains as of old. Everything has to run incessantly to keep moving. For only the universal triumph of the rhythm of mechanical production and reproduction promises that nothing changes and nothing unsuitable will appear. Any additions to the well-proven culture inventory are too much of a speculation. The ossified forms, such as the sketch, short story, problem film, or hit song, are the standardized average of late liberal taste, dictated with threats from above. 
The people at the top in the culture agencies who work in harmony as only one manager can with another, whether he comes from the rag trade or from college, have long since reorganized and rationalized the objective spirit. One might think that an omnipresent authority has sifted the material and drawn up an official catalog of cultural commodities to provide a smooth supply of available mass-produced lines. The ideas are written in the cultural firmament where they had already been numbered by Plato and were indeed numbers incapable of increase and immutable. Amusement and all the elements of the culture industry existed long before the latter came into existence. Now they are taken over from above and brought up to date. The culture industry can pride itself on having energetically executed the previously clumsy transposition of art into the sphere of consumption, on making this a principle, on divesting amusement of its obtrusive naivetes and improving the type of commodities. The more absolute it became, the more ruthless it was in forcing every outsider either into bankruptcy or into a syndicate, and became more refined and elevated until it ended up as a synthesis of Beethoven and the Casino de Paris. It enjoys a double victory. The truth it extinguishes without it can reproduce at will as a lie within. Light art as such, distraction is not a decadent form. Anyone who complains that it is a betrayal of the ideal of pure expression is under an illusion about society. The purity of bourgeois art, which hypostasized itself as a world of freedom in contrast to what was happening in the material world, was from the beginning bought with the exclusion of the lower classes, with whose cause the, re the real universality art keeps faith precisely by its freedom from the ends of the false universality. Serious art has been withheld from those for whom the hardship and oppression of life make a mockery of seriousness, and who must be glad if they can use time not spent at the production line just to keep going. Light art has been the shadow of autonomous art. It is the social bad conscience of serious art. The truth which the latter necessarily lacked because of its social premises gives the other the semblance of legitimacy. The division itself is the truth. It does at least express the negativity of the culture with which, which the different spheres constitute. Least of all can the antithesis be reconciled by absorbing light into serious art, or vice versa. But that is what the culture industry attempts. The eccentricity of the, of the circus, peep show, and brothel is an embarrassed is as embarrassing to it as that of Schoenberg and Karl Kraus. And so the jazz musician Benny Goodman appears with the Budapest String Quartet, more pedantic rhythmically than all philharmonic clarinetist, while, well, oh, fuck, more, fuck. And so the jazz musician Benny Goodman appears with the Budapest String Quartet, more pedantic rhythmically than any philharmonic clarinetist, while the style of the Budapest players is as uniform and sugary as that of Guy Lombardo. But what is significant is not vulgarity, stupidity, and lack of polish. The culture industry did away with yesterday's rubbish by its own perfection, and by forbidding and domesticating the amateurish, although it constantly allows gross blunders, without which the standard of the exalted style can be perceived. But what is new is that the irreconcilable elements of culture, art, and distraction are subordinated to one end and subsumed under one false formula, the totality of the culture industry. It consists of repetition, that its characteristic innovations are never anything more than improvements of mass reproduction is not external to the system. It is with good reason that the interest of innumerable consumers is directed to the, to the technique and not to the contents, which are stubbornly repeated, outworn, and by now half discredited. The social power which the spectators worship shows itself more effic effectively in the omnipresence of the stereotype imposed by technical skill than in the stale ideologies for which the ephem ephemeral contents stand in. Nevertheless, the culture industry remains the entertainment business. Its influence over the consumers is established by entertainment, 
that will ultimately be broken not by an outright decree, but by the hostility inherent in the principle of entertainment to what is greater than itself. Since all the trends of the culture industry are profoundly embedded in the public by the, so the whole social process, they are encouraged by the survival of the market in this area. Demand has not yet been replaced by simple obedience. As is well known, the major reorganization of the film industry shortly before World War I, the material prerequisite of its expansion, was precisely its deliberate acceptance of the public's needs as recorded at the box office, a procedure which was hardly thought necessary in the pioneering days of the screen. The same opinion is held today by the captains of the film industry, who take as their criterion the more or less phenomenal song hits by wisely never, but wisely never have recourse to the judgment of truth, the opposite criterion. Business is their ideology. It is quite correct that the power of the culture industry resides in its ident identification with a manufactured need and not in simple contrast to it, even if this contrast were one of complete power and complete powerlessness. Amusement under late capitalism is the prolongation of work. It is sought after as an escape from, from the mechanized work process and to recruit strength in order to be able to cope with it again. But at the same time, mechanization has such power over a man's leisure and happiness and so profoundly determines the manufacture of amusement goods that his experiences are inevitably after images of the work process itself. The ostensible content is merely a faded foreground. What sinks in is the automatic succession of standardized operations. What happens at work, in the factory, or in the office can only be escaped from by approximation to it in one's leisure time. All amusement suffers from this incurable malady. Pleasure hardens into boredom because if it is to remain pleasure, it must not demand any effort and therefore moves rigorously in the worn grooves of association. No independent thinking must be expected from the audience. The product prescribes every reaction, not by its natural structure, which collapses under reflection, but by signals. Any logical connection calling for mental effort is painstakingly avoided. As far as possible, developments must follow from the immediately preceding situation and never from the idea of the whole. For the attentive moviegoer, any individual scene will give him the whole thing. Even the set pattern itself still seems dangerous, offering some meaning, wretched as it might be, where only meaninglessness is acceptable. After the plot is maliciously deprived of the development demanded by characters and matter according to the old pattern, Instead, the next step is what the script writer takes to be the most striking effect in the particular situation. Being although elaborate, surprise interrupts the storyline. The tendency mischievi mischievously to f the tendency mischievously to fall back on pure nonsense, which was a legitimate part of popular art, farce and clowning, right up to Chaplin and the Marx Brothers is most obvious in the unpretentious kinds. This tendency has completely asserted itself in the text of the novelty song, in the thriller movie, and in cartoons. Although in films starring Greer Garson and Bette Davis, the unity of the socio-psychological case study provides something approximating a claim to a consistent plot. The idea itself, together with the objects of comedy and terror, is massacred and fragmented. Novelty songs have always existed on a contempt for meaning which, as predecessors and successors of psychoanalysis, they reduce to the monotony of sexual symbolism. Today, detective and adventure films no longer give the audience the opportunity to experience the resolution. In the non-ironic varieties of the genre, it has also to rest content with the simple horror of situations which have almost ceased to be to be linked in any way. Cartoons were only exponents of fantasy as opposed to rationalism. They ensured that justice was done to the creatures and objects they electrified by giving the maimed specimens a second life. All they do today is to confirm the victory of technological reason over truth. 
A few years ago, they had a consistent plot which only broke up in the final moments in a crazy chase, and thus resembled the old slapstick comedy. Now, however, time relations have shifted. In the, first, in the very first sequence, a motive is stated so that in the course of the action, destruction can get to work on it. With the audience in pursuit, the protagonist becomes the, worst, the worthless object of general violence. The quantity of organized amusement changes into the quality of organized cruelty. The self-elected censors of the film industry, with whom it enjoys a close relationship, Watch over the unfolding of the crime, which is as drawn out as a hunt. Fun replaces the pleasure which the sight of an embrace would allegedly afford, and postpones satisfaction till the day of the pogrom. Instead, as cartoon, insofar as cartoons do any more than accustom the senses to the new tempo, they hammer into every brain the old lesson that continuous friction, the breaking down of all individual resistance, is the condition of life in this society. Donald Duck in the cartoons and the unfortunate in real life gets their thrashing so that the audience can learn to take their own punishment. The enjoyment of the violence suffered by the movie character turns into violence against the spectator and distraction into exertion. Nothing that the experts have devised as a stimulant must escape the weary eye. No stupidity is allowed in the face of all the trickery. One has to follow everything and even display the smart responses shown and recommended in the film. This raises the question whether the culture industry fulfills the function of diverting minds which it boasts about so loudly. If most of the radio stations and movie theaters were closed down, the consumers would probably not lose so very much. To walk from the street into the movie theater is no longer to enter a world of dream. As soon as the very existence of these institutions no longer made it obligatory to use them, there would be no great urge to do so. Such closures would not be reactionary machine wrecking. The disappointment would be felt not so much by the enthusiasts as by the slow-witted who are the ones who suffer for everything anyhow. In spite of the films which are intended to complete her integration, the housewife finds in the darkness of the movie theater a place of refuge where she can sit for a few hours with nobody watching, just as she used to look out of the window when there were still homes and rest in the evening. The unemployed in the great cities find coolness in summer and warmth in winter in these temperature-controlled locations. Otherwise, despite its size, this bloated pleasure apparatus adds no dignity to man's life. The idea of fully exploiting available technical resources and the facilities for aesthetic mass consumption is part of the economic system which refuses to exploit resources to abolish hunger. The culture industry perpetually cheats its consumers of what it, perpe what it perpetually promises. The promissory note which, with its plots and staging, it draws on pleasure is endlessly prolonged. The promise, which is actually all the spectacle consists of, is illusory. All it actually confirms is that the real point will never be reached, that the diner must be satisfied with the menu. In front of the appetite stimulated by all those brilliant names and images, there is finally set no more than a commendation of the depressing everyday world it sought to escape. Of course, works of art were not sexual exhibitions either. However, by representing deprivation as negative, they retracted, as it were, the prostitution of the impulse and rescued by mediation what was denied. The secret aesthetic sublimation is its representation of fulfillment as a broken promise. The culture industry does not sublimate, it represses. By repeatedly exposing the objects of desire, breasts in a clinging sweater, or the naked torso of the athletic hero, it only stimulates the unsublimated for-pleasure which habitual deprivation has long since reduced to a masochistic semblance. There is no erotic situation which, while insinuating and exciting, does not fail to indicate unmis unmistakably that things can never go that far. The Hayes office merely confirms the ritual of Tantalus that the culture industry has established anyway. Works of art are ascetic and unashamed. 
the culture industry is pornographic and prudish. Love is downgraded to romance, and after the descent, much is permitted. Even license as a marketable speciality has its quota, bearing the trade prescription daring. The mass production of the sexual automatically achieves its repression. Because of its ubiquity, the film star with whom one is meant to fall in love is from the outset a copy of himself. Every tenor voice comes to sound like a Caruso record, and the natural faces of Texas girls are like the successful models by whom Hollywood has typecast them. The mechanical reproduction of beauty, which reactionary cultural fanaticism wholeheartedly serves in its methodical idolization of individuality, leaves no room for that unconscious idolatry which was once essential to beauty. The triumph over beauty is celebrated by humor. The schadenfreude that every successful deprivation calls forth. There is laughter because there is nothing to laugh at. Laughter, whether conciliatory or terrible, always occurs when some fear passes. It indicates liberation either from physical danger or from the grip of logic. Conciliatory laughter is heard as the echo of an escape from power. The wrong kind overcomes fear by capitulating to the forces which are to be feared. It is the echo of power as something inescapable. Fun is a medicinal bath. The pleasure industry never fails to prescribe it. It makes laughter the instrument of the fraud practiced on happiness. Moments of happiness are without laughter. Only operettas and films portray sex to the accompaniment of resounding laughter. But Baudelaire is as devoid of humor as Holderlin. In the false society, laughter is a disease which has attacked happiness and is drawing it into its worthless totality. To laugh at something is always to deride it, and the life which, according to Bergson, in laughter breaks through the barrier, is actually an invading barbaric life, self-assertion, prepared to parade its liberation from any scruple when the social occasion arises. Such a laughing audience is a parody of humanity. Its members are monads, all dedicated to the pleasure of being ready for anything at the expense of everyone else. Their harmony is a caricature of solidarity. What is fiendish about this false laughter is that it is a compelling parody of the best, which is conciliatory. Delight is austere. Res severa verum gaudium. The monastic theory that not, asceticism, that not asceticism but the sexual act denotes the renunciation of attainable bliss receives negative confirmation in the gravity of the lover who, with foreboding, commits his life to the fleeting moment. In the culture industry, jovial denial takes the place of the pain found in ecstasy and in, and in asceticism. The supreme law is that they shall not satisfy their desires at any point or at any price. They must laugh and be content with laughter. In every product of the culture industry, the permanent denial imposed by civilization is once again unmistakably demonstrated and inflicted on its victims. To offer and to deprive them of something is one and the same. This is what happens in erotic films. Precisely because it must never take place, everything centers upon copulation. In films, it is more strictly forbidden for an illegitimate relationship to be omitted without the parties being punished than for a millionaire's future son-in-law to be active in the labor movement. In contrast to the liberal era, industrialized as well as popular culture may wax indignant at capitalism, but it cannot renounce the threat of castration. This is fundamental. It outlasts the organized acceptance of the uniformed scene in the film, which are produced to that end and in reality. What is decisive today is no longer Puritanism, although it still asserts itself in the form of women's organizations, but the necessity inherent in the system not to leave the customer alone, not for a moment to allow him any suspicion that resistance is possible. The principle dictates that he should be shown all his needs as capable of fulfillment, 
but that those needs should be so predetermined that he feels himself to be the eternal consumer, the object of the culture industry. Not only does it make him believe that the deception it practices is dis- is satisfaction, but it goes further and implies that whatever the state of affairs, he must put up with what is offered. The escape from everyday drudgery, which the whole culture industry promises may be compared to the daughter's abduction in the cartoon. The father is holding the latter in the dark. The paradise offered by the culture industry is the same old drudgery. Both escape an elopement are pre-designed to lead back to the starting point. Pleasure promotes the resignation which it ought to help to forget. Even today, the culture industry dresses works of art like political slogans and forces them upon a resistant public at reduced prices. They are as accessible for public enjoyment as a park. But the disappearance of their genuine commodity character does not mean that they have been abolished in the life of a free society, but that the last defense against the reduction to culture goods has fallen. The abolition of educational privilege by the device of clearance sales does not open for the masses the spheres from which they were formerly excluded, but given existing social conditions, contributes directly to the, to the decay of education and the progress of barbaric meaninglessness. Those who spent their money in the 19th or the early 20th century to see a play or to go to a concert respected the performance as much as the money they spent. The bourgeois who wanted to get something out of it tried occasionally to establish some rapport with the work. Evidence for this is to be found in the literary introductions to works or in the commentaries on Faust. These were the first steps towards the biogra- biographical coding and other practices to which a work of art is subjected today. Even in the early prosperous days of business, exchange value did carry use value as a mere appendix, but had developed it as a prerequisite for its own existence. This was socially helpful for works of art. Art exercised some restraint on the bourgeois as long as it cost money. That is now a thing of the past. Now that it has lost every restraint and there is no need to pay any money, the proximity of art to those who are exposed to it completes the alienation and assimilates one to the other under the banner of triumphant objectivity. Criticism and respect disappear in the culture industry. The former becomes a mechanical expertise. The latter is succeeded by a shallow cult of leading personalities. Consumers now find nothing expensive. Nevertheless, they suspect that the less anything costs, the less it is being given them. The double mistrust of traditional culture as ideology is combined with mistrust of industrialized culture as a swindle. When thrown in free, the now debased works of art, together with the rubbish to which the medium assimilates them, are secretly rejected by the fortunate recipients, who are supposed to be satisfied by the mere fact that there is so much to be seen and heard. Everything can be obtained. The screenos and vaudevilles in the movie theater, the competitions for guessing music, the free books, rewards, and gifts offered on certain radio programs are not mere accidents, but a continuation of the practice obtaining with culture products. The symphony becomes a reward for listening to the radio, and if technology had its way, the film would be delivered to people's homes as happens with the radio. It is moving toward the commercial system. Television points the way to a development which might easily enough force the Warner Brothers into what would certainly be the unwelcome position of serious musicians and cultural conservatives. But the gift system has already taken hold among consumers. As culture is represented as a bonus with undoubted private and social advantages, they have to seize the chance. They rush in lest they missed something. Exactly what is not clear, but in any case, the only ones with a chance are their participants. Fascism, however, hopes to use the training the culture industry has given these recipients of gifts in order to organize them into its own forced battalions. Culture is a paradoxical commodity. So completely is it subject to the law of exchange that it is no longer exchanged. It is 
so blindly consumed in use that it can no longer be used. Therefore, it amalgamates with advertising. The more meaningless the latter seems to be under a monopoly, the more omnip- omnipotent it becomes. The motives are markedly economic. One could certainly live without the culture industry. Therefore, it necessarily creates too much satiation and apathy. In itself, it has few resources itself to correct this. Advertising is its, its elixir of life, but as its product never fails to reduce to a mere promise the enjoyment which it promises as a commodity, it eventually coincides with publicity, which it needs because it cannot be enjoyed. In a competitive society, advertising performed the social service of informing the buyer about the market. It made choice easier and helped the unknown, but more efficient supplier to dispose of his goods. Far from costing time, it saved it. Today, when the free market is coming to an end, those who control the system are entrenching themselves in it. It strengthens the firm bond between the consumers and the big combines. Only those who can pay the exorbitant rates charged by the advertising agencies, chief of which are the radio networks themselves, that is only those who are already in a position to do so, or are co-opted by the decision of the bank's and industrial capital can enter the pseudo market as sellers. The costs of advertising, which finally flow back into the pockets of the combines, make it unnecessary to defeat unwelcome outsiders by laborious competition. They guarantee that power will remain in the same hands, not unlike those economic decisions by which the establishment and running of undertakings is controlled in a totalitarian state. Advertising today is a negative principle, a blocking device. Everything that does not bear its stamp is economically suspect. Universal publicity is in no way necessary for people to get to know the kinds of goods whose supply is restricted anyway. It helps sales only indirectly. For a particular firm to phase out a current advertising practice constitutes a loss of prestige and a breach of the discipline imposed by the influential influential clique on its members. In wartime, goods which are unobtainable are still advertised, merely to keep industrial power in view. Subsidizing ideological media is more important than the repetition of the name, because the system obliges every product to use advertising. It has permeated the idiom, the style of the culture industry. Its victory is so complete that it is no longer the system that it is no longer evident in the key positions. The huge buildings of the top men, floodlit stone advertisements, are free of advertising. At most they exhibit on the rooftops in monumental brilliance and without any self glorification, the firm's initials. But in contrast, The 19th century houses, whose architecture still shamefully indicates that they can be used as a consumption commodity and are intended to be lived in, are covered with posters and inscriptions from the ground right up to and beyond the roof, until they become no more than backgrounds for bills and signboards. Advertising becomes art and nothing else, just as Goebbels, with foresight, combines them, lart pur... pur (laughs) advertising for its own sake a pure representation of social power in the most influential american magazines life and fortune a quick glance can now scarcely distinguish advertising from editorial picture and text the latter features an enthusiastic and gratuitous account of the great man with with illustrations of his life and grooming habits which will bring him new fans, while the advertisement pages use so many factual photographs and details that they represent the ideal of information, which the editorial part has only begun to try to achieve. The assembly line character of the culture industry, the synthetic planned method of turning out its products, factory-like not only in the studio but, more or less, in the compilation of cheap biographies, pseudo-documentary novels, and hit songs, is very suited to advertising. 
The important individual points by becoming detachable, interchangeable, and even technically alienated from any connected meeting lend themselves to ends external to the work. The effect, the trick, the isolated, repeatable device have always been used to exhibit goods for advertising purposes. And today, every monster close-up of a star is an advertisement for her name, and every hit song a plug for its tune. Advertising and the culture industry merge technically as well as economically. In both cases, the same thing can be seen in innumerable places, and the mechanical repetition of the same culture product has come to, the, to be the same as that of the propaganda slogan. In both cases, the insistent demand for effectiveness makes technology into psychotechnology, into a procedure for manipulating men. In both cases, the standards are the striking yet familiar, the easy yet catchy, the skillful yet simple. The object is to overpower the customer, who is conceived as absent-minded or resistant. By the language he speaks, he makes his own contribution to culture as publicity. The more completely language is lost in the announcement, the more words are debased as substantial vehicles of meaning and become signs devoid of quality. The more purely and transparently words communicate what is intended, the more impenetrable they become. The, the demythologization of language, taken as an element of the whole process of enlightenment, is a relapse into magic. Word and essential content were distinct yet inseparable from one another. Concepts like melancholy and history, even life, were recognized, recognized in the word, which separated them out and preserved them. Its form simultaneously constituted and reflected them. The absolute separation, which makes the moving accidental and its relation to the object arbitrary, puts an end to the superstitious fusion of word and thing. Anything in a, deter in, anything in a determined literal sequence which goes beyond the correlation to the event is rejected as unclear and as verbal metaphysics. But the result is that the word, which can now be only a sign without any meaning, becomes so fixed to the thing that it is just a petrified formula. This affects language and objects alike. Instead of making the object experiential, the purified word treats it as an abstract instance, and everything else, now excluded by the demand for ruthless clarity from expression itself now banished, fades away in reality. A left half at football, a black shirt, a member of the Hitler Youth, and so on, are no more than names. If before its rationalization, the word had given rise to lies as well as to longing, now, after its rationalization, it is a straitjacket for longing more even than, f even than for lies. The blindness and dumbness of the data to which positivism reduces the world pass over into language itself which restricts itself to recording those data. Terms themselves become impenetrable. They obtain a striking force, a power of, ad of adhesion and repulsion, which makes them like their extreme opposite incantations. They come to be a kind of trick because the name of the prima donna is cooked up in the studio on a statistical basis or because a welfare state is anathematized by using taboo terms such as bureaucrats or intellectuals, or because base practice uses the same or the name of the country as a charm. In general, the name to which magic most easily attaches is undergoing a chemical change, a metamorphosis into capricious, manipulable, manipulable designations whose effect is admittedly now calculable, but which for that very reason is just as despotic as that of the archaic name. First names, those archaic remnants, have been brought up to date either by stylization as advertising trademarks, film stars' surnames have become first names, or by collective standardization. In comparison, the bourgeois family name, which, instead of being a trademark, once individualized its bearer by relating him to his own past history, seems antiquated. It arouses a strange embarrassment in Americans. In order to hide the awkward distance between individuals, they call one another Bob and Harry as interchangeable team members. 
This practice reduces relations between human beings to the good fellowship of the sporting community and is a defense against the true kind of relationship. Signif- signification, which is only which is the only function of a word admitted by semantics, reaches perfection in the sign. Whether folk songs were rightly or wrongly called upper-class culture and decay, their elements have only acquired their popular form through a long process of repeated transmission. The spread of popular songs, on the other hand, takes place at lightning speed. The American expression fad used for fashions which appear like epidemics, that is, inflamed by highly concentrated economic forces, designated this phenomenon long before totalitarian advertising bosses enforced the general lines of culture. When the German fascists decide one day to launch a word, say, intolerable, over the loudspeakers, the next day the whole nation is saying intolerable. By the same pattern, the nations against whom the weight of the German Blitzkrieg was thrown took the word into their own jargon. The general repetition of names for measures to be taken by the authorities makes them, so to speak, familiar, just as the brand name on everybody's lips increased sales in the era of the free market. The blind and rapidly spreading repetition removed. Or hold on. The blind and rapidly spreading repetition of words with special designations links advertising with the totalitarian watchword. The layer of experience which created the words for their speakers has been removed. In this swift appropriation, language acquires the coldness which until now it had only on billboards and in the advertisement columns of newspapers. Innumerable people use words and expressions which they have either ceased to understand or employ only because they trigger off conditioned reflexes. In this sense, words are trademarks which are finally all the more firmly linked to the things they denote, the less their linguistic sense is grasped. The Minister for Mass Education talks incomprehendingly of dynamic forces, and the hit songs unceasingly celebrate reverie and rhapsody, yet base their popularity precisely on the magic of the unintelligible as creating the thrill of a more exalted life. Other stereotypes, such as memory, are still partly comprehended, but escape from the experience which might allow them content. They appear like enclaves in the spoken language, on the radio of Flesh and Hitler. They may be recognized from the affected pronunciation of the announcer when he says to the nation, Good night, everybody, or This is the Hitler Youth, and even intones the Fuhrer in a way imitated by millions. In such cliches, the last bond between sedimentary experience and language is severed, which still had a reconciling effect in dialect dialect in the 19th century. But in the prose of the journalist, whose adaptable attitude led to his appointment as an all-German editor, the German words become petrified alien terms. Every word shows how far it has been debased by the fascist pseudo-folk community. By now, of course, this kind of language is already universal, totalitarian. All the violence done to words is so vile that one can hardly bear to hear them any longer. The announcer does not need to speak pompously. He would indeed be impossible if his inflection were different from that of his particular audience. But as against that, the language and gestures of the audience and spectators are colored more strongly than ever before by the culture industry even in fine nuances which cannot yet be explained experimentally. Today, the culture industry has taken over the civilizing inheritance of the entrepreneurial frontier democracy, whose appreciation of intellectual deviations was never very finely attuned. All are free to dance and enjoy themselves, just as they have been free since the historical neutralization of religion, to join any of the innumerable, innumerable sects but freedom to choose an ideology, since ideology always reflects economic coercion, everywhere proves to be freedom to choose what is always the same. The way in which a girl accepts and keeps the obligatory date, the inflection on the telephone or in the most intimate situation, the choice of words in conversation and the whole inner life as classified by the now somewhat devalued depth psychology, bear witness to man's attempt to make himself a proficient apparatus, 
similar even in emotions to the models served by the culture industry. The most intimate reactions of human beings have been so thoroughly reified that the idea of anything specific to themselves now persists only as an utterly abstract notion. Personality scarcely signifies anything more than shining white teeth and freedom from body odor and emotions. The triumph of advertising in the culture industry is that consumers feel compelled to buy and use its products even though they see through them.